in the small southern hamlet of Clarksville, Tennessee. Small baby girl, 4.5 pounds in weight, was born to Ed and Blanche. She was a sickly child, always had some particular issue or disease. Born in 1940, and Ed and Blanche would have to make the 50-mile trek from Clarksville, Tennessee, all the way to Nashville, Tennessee, because that was the only place where a medical facility, Meharry Medical College, uh, would allow a family that had been kissed by nature's son uh, to have their child checked by professional doctors. Ed and Blanche loved baby girl, as they called her, only 4.5 pounds in weight. But she was the 20th of 22 children born to Ed and Blanche. Before she was the age of five, she dealt with measles, uh, scarlet fever, and a variety of other diseases, and eventually was stricken with polio. She was told that she would never walk again. Ed and Blanche tell the story that they took baby girl to the Meharry Medical College, and the doctors took her back into the examination room. And when they came out, uh, their faces were fallen. And they said to Ed and Blanche, they said, we are sorry. Uh, your little girl has made it through scarlet fever and measles and a variety of other diseases, but she's been stricken with polio. She will never walk like other people. She will never run like other children. And then a doctor attempting to make a, a sense of this cosmic coincidence simply said, she was born this way. She will always stay this way. At that moment, Ed and Blanche gathered baby girl. They made that 50-mile trek back to Clarksville, Tennessee, and the entire family was gathered in the living room. They wanted to know what the doctors had stated about baby girl. And Ed and Blanche told everyone, baby girl has been stricken with polio. She will not walk like other children. She will not run like other children. The doctors told us she was born this way. She will always stay this way. Everyone in the family was upset. Everyone in the family was crying, except one person. Everyone in the family accepted what the earthly doctor stated, except baby girl's grandmother, better known as Big Mama. She said, you all can cry if you want to. Uh, the doctors in Nashville, they have some expertise, but I know another doctor, a doctor who has a higher authority. And from this moment on, I'm going into deep prayer for baby girl. It is Big Mama who prayed every morning and every night for baby girl. And it was on the eve of her 12th birthday that Big Mama said to baby girl, you're coming with me to a revival meeting. Now, for those of you who know nothing about revival, it is a meeting during the week where people gather uh, together for worship service every evening. And in the Pentecostal community, it is very unique because in those services, an individual who is in need will come to the altar and someone will pray over them. And they speak of the fact that the Spirit sometimes can descend and release people of the challenges they face day to day. And so Big Mama said to Baby Girl, you're going to revival meeting tonight. And Baby Girl, of course, did not want to go to revival meeting because she had braces upon her legs. She did not like the fact that people would look at her as she would waddle down the aisle. But of course, Big Mama gave Baby Girl one of those Big Mama looks, meaning either you go with me or you deal with me in a different way. And of course, Baby Girl made her way to church. They went through the service with the songs and the prayers, and eventually after the preacher finished his um, lesson and sermon, they asked for those who were in need to come to the altar. And Big Mama looked over at Baby Girl and said, it's your time, make your way to the altar. Baby Girl was uh, a little bit nervous. She did not want to walk down the aisle so that everybody would see that she had braces upon her legs. But Big Mama gave her one of those Big Mama looks again and she waddled her way down to the altar. The elders of the church and the women of the church surrounded baby girl and began to pray. They started off praying in English, but then they started to speak in tongues. And as they prayed, baby girl says she felt something from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. And she heard a distinct voice that told her, baby girl, it's time to run. But baby girl already had in her mind 
uh, that she was born a particular way, she would stay this way for the rest of her life. She heard the voice again stating to her, it is time for you to run. She was trying to make sense. This was cognitive dissonance within her mind because on one hand, doctors had told her that she would never have the opportunity to run like other children, but she was now hearing a voice very clear that was saying, it's time to run. And so after uh, the saints took their hands off of her and said, amen, baby girl, listen to the voice. She began to walk around the church. And then she eventually started to skip around the church and then run around the church and eventually her braces fell off. Baby girl kept running, ran all the way through high school, ran to Tennessee State University and eventually ran to the Olympics. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you who baby girl was. Baby girl was Wilma Rudolph. She had a praying grandmother who said, no matter what someone may say in reference to your condition, your condition does not have to be your conclusion. And that lifts up this text today about a woman who had been bent over for years. And she had been going to church for 18 years. She had a particular view of the world. There she was in a space that should have been the healing space, but everybody assumed that her condition was a permanent part of her life until Jesus. Ah, that's a wonderful phrase, until Jesus. How often do we accept a particular condition or an orthodoxy, an idea, and say that it cannot be shifted or it cannot be changed until Jesus? Jesus is always shifting and changing our particular ideas. What we think is impossible, Jesus is always taking the prefix off and saying it's possible. This is what is so powerful about Jesus. Jesus shows up on Sabbath, the time of worship. But what is so powerful is a woman with a condition who was considered to have diminished capacity was still in church. If I may stop here, I love this woman. The reason I love her so much is because this woman is willing to worship even though she is struggling with a condition that seems to be permanent. What a beautiful thing to witness that after 18 years, after 18 years of prayer, after 18 years of work, bent over, only seeing kneecaps in the floor with limited vision, she had enough vision to make her way to the worship space. Even if this woman was never healed, she speaks to the boldness and tenacity we need to have in this day and age, to have the kind of spirit where we are willing to go to the worship house and pray, to have the kind of spirit that even though you may have a condition to say that I'm gonna keep on coming, it may not be this year that emancipation is coming. It may not be this year that liberation is coming. It may not be this year that deliverance is coming, but I will keep on coming. And even if it doesn't come, I will be in a space where I will be in the presence of God. She was faithful. Until Jesus comes, something happens. She was bent over. And there Jesus sees her. And this is the wonderful thing. She does not ask, Jesus, straighten me up. Jesus recognizes a need and loosens the woman at that moment. Isn't this beautiful? The fact that Jesus will see us before we see Jesus. She couldn't see him. She could see sandals just like everyone else, the same type of sandal, but maybe in my sanctified imagination, maybe his sandals and his feet looked a little bit different than a high priest. Maybe his sandals and feet looked a little bit different than the tax collector. She saw something different, maybe possibly, or maybe not. But one thing was for sure. She may not have seen Jesus' face, but she heard his voice. You are free. You are loosed. Now, it would seem that the text would end at that moment. This would be a moment of celebration. And it was a moment of celebration. Jesus celebrating. The woman celebrating. I am no longer bent over. I now can guess what? I can go back to work. So what Jesus did by straightening the woman, 
he automatically shifted her economic possibilities. She could now work. She could now be considered a full participant in society. For when someone had a condition, they made the assumption that God had cursed you. It was an ancient form of what is called prosperity theology. That you can look at somebody and make the determination whether or not God's hand is on that person. If they're wealthy, hey, they must have God's hand upon them. If they are poor, oh, God's hand is not on them. But Jesus is breaking down barriers, saying that you do not define your sacred relationship by the material. It's relational. He saw a need and said, woman, thou art loosed. A woman is now free. A woman is now loose. A woman is now living her full capacity. That is what Jesus does, and that is what ministry is supposed to do. We are to recognize needs, not when someone says, can I have some help? When we see people bent over, children bent over in the public school system who do not see the full vision of their own possibilities, we're called to straighten them up. When we see young men and young women who have been incarcerated bent over as a result of a variety of social conditions, and they do not see the full vision of their possibility, we're called to straighten them up. And in our democracy, when so many of our politicians are bent over and do not see the fullness of all humanity and everyone in these yet to be United States, it is not the politician, but it is the people who operate with a moral compass to tell them to straighten up so that they can see new possibilities. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Jesus is straightening people up. He's been straightening people up for 2,000 years. He'll straighten you up, straighten me up. It's a beautiful thing. And so it would seem that this would be the end of the story, that we would leave this pericope and celebrate the beauty of this healing. A woman who now is at full capacity, the economics have changed. The psychology has changed because she thinks of herself differently. The sociology has changed because now people who normally would shun her were now engaging her. It was changing her theology because no longer did she think that she was cursed by God, but now she was blessed by God. It was a holistic moment that was happening at this moment as a result of this healing. But the text does not stop because the reality is we're in the text. Yes, with the bent over woman, but we're also a high priest who gets angry at Jesus. And if I may use my uh, sanctified imagination and a little bit of the OM3 translation, that is the Otis Moss III translation of the text, the high priest says, hey, hey, Jesus, you know we don't do healing around here unless it is between the hours of 10 and 2 on the Sabbath. You can heal then, but any other time, uh, that is not a time to heal. And Jesus becomes indignant and then offers this unique question. He says, here you go, Mr. High Priest. Now, if your ox or your mule or your donkey or whatever you utilized uh, for uh, your economic viability and it, was, it had fallen into a ditch, it was tied up, and it was a Sabbath, wouldn't you go out there and release it or would you leave it there for 24 hours to possibly die? He, he was pushing there at his interpretation, the high priest's interpretation. The high priest had a doctrine. Oftentimes we have a tendency to be fundamentalist with what God gives us, that there are no variables whatsoever. There are no circumstances, extenuating circumstances. And we say it must be this way black or white. It must be A or it must be C. But God operates a little bit differently. It's Thelonious Monk who put it this way. He said, if you really want to understand music, it is not the notes that are played, it is the rest. It's what's in between the notes. And God is always speaking in between. He gives us, God gives us uh, the word. But at the same time, in between that, all of that beauty, all of the interpretation, all of the wrestling with God and the wrestling with the text is that the Sabbath was not made so that it would harm people. The Sabbath was made 
to deepen one's relationship with one who is pure love. And if we do not operate with pure love, then we have turned our back upon God. Can you imagine this scene that Jesus begins to correct the high priest? The one who is the word that becomes flesh begins to correct the one who thinks that he is the chief hermeneutic officer of the word? Can you imagine this? Uh, that Jesus is now Christ said, I am the word that becomes flesh. Don't argue with me. I am uh, the one who is the interpreter. I am your midrash in your presence. What a beautiful thing. And everybody is stunned and a little bit upset. But if I may use my homiletical imagination, I can imagine that the woman was just standing behind Jesus a few feet. She was smiling and she was shouting as she heard the conversation between the high priest and Jesus. And then after Jesus left, I can imagine her leaving the synagogue, walking around the city, looking at the sky, staring at the birds, looking at the mountains, just dancing and moving and speaking joy and love to everybody she encountered. And I can imagine someone saying to her, hey, excuse me, ma'am, it doesn't take all of that. And she says, it may not take all that for you, but when I look back over my life and I see what God has done in my life, my soul begins to shout hallelujah. When God has straightened you up, given you new vision, and you have witnessed those who should have been embracing you being rebuked and corrected so that they can be a more compassionate ministry, you truly have been blessed. The people said, she was born this way, she will stay this way. But when you have an encounter with Jesus, Jesus will always tell you your condition is not your conclusion.